While these two blocks of aluminium right here in front of me might look quite similar to one another, there is actually a huge difference between them. One is just a block of raw aluminium, while the other is almost a finished product. Now, I bet you're thinking to yourself right now, wait, this is supposed to be what a high-end device looks like? But it's just a cube! And you're right, it is just a cube. But don't be fooled by its simplicity, because making complex devices appear as if they are simple takes way more effort than you think. Effort that becomes way more apparent if we look at this enclosure from the other side. The first thing you probably noticed is actually the least relevant part, and it's these cut marks on the surface of the aluminium. These marks are likely measured in nanometers and you really cannot feel them even if you run your fingernails through them. They're irrelevant because the whole enclosure will get sandblasted as part of the preparation for anodizing, so they'll pretty much completely go away. Well, at least on the outside of the enclosure, because we might not sandblast them completely on the inside as part of the cost-saving efforts, but we'll talk about that later on. Now, if you've been following this channel for a while, then you already know that we want to make this device passively cooled, which is where this central block comes in. The part that sticks out the most corresponds to the CPU location on the PCB, and we've designed the gap between the two, so the distance between the top of the CPU and the corresponding surface on the enclosure, to measure around 3 millimeters, and that's because we'll use a 5 millimeter thermal foam that we'll put in for better thermal conductivity. To ensure the correct amount of compression then, we're using these two standoffs here, along with 5 other ones that'll also make sure that the PCB stays in place. I've explained these two in one of my previous videos, but just in case you missed it, here's a TLDR. Because the PCB features two SFP cages that are located on the very edge of the PCB, we unfortunately couldn't put a mounting hole there. However, we still needed for something to provide enough structural rigidity for the PCB to not bend, well, under any circumstance. So we decided we're going to put these two mounting holes here, one on each of the two sides of the PCB as close as we can get them to the corner. And because of that, one is located just behind where the SFP cages will end up when assembled, and the other just behind the RJ45 port that's closest to the edge with set SFP cages. Now, the keen-eyed among you have probably noticed that there aren't any standoffs for the rearmost two mounting holes, and well, there's a good reason for that. You see, to be able to make the enclosure as small as possible, we had to resort to undercuts. I'm not sure whether that's the correct English term for them, but they're basically parts of the enclosure that have gaps below them, and we have four of those in our enclosure. This middle part here, two corner ones, and a hidden one I'll show you later on. The middle part is easy. Well, at least easier than the corner two, because all we had to do is take a sufficiently large T-shaped uh, drill bit and run from one side of the enclosure to the other. The corner ones, on the other hand, are not that simple. You see, your normal milling bits are shaped like a cylinder, meaning that the width of the neck is pretty much the same as the width of the cutting head. Because of this, the torsion force gets distributed somewhat evenly throughout the length of the bit, while cutting the material, of course. But in T-shaped bits, that's not the case. Because the neck of the bit is thinner than the cutting head, the head has a higher momentum, and because of this difference in momentum, the torsion forces in the neck get much larger comparatively. This is why when cutting underhangs, we usually have to resort both to slower cutting speeds as well as cutting off less material away with each pass. We were even forced to cheat a little because the T-shaped bit we're using already had the smallest neck width possible for the radius we have in the corner of the enclosure. It's really hard to catch this cheat on camera, but we had to mill away a bit of material on each of the two radii where the bottom part of the enclosure will get mounted to the cover. The only purpose of these cutouts was to make sure that the T-shaped bit would get deep enough without its neck bumping into the enclosure, which, as you can probably imagine, would likely damage or even break the bit. And since these bits aren't cheap, well, 
this was the solution, or should I say a compromise. Aesthetically, we're not concerned about it, because it's a fairly minor cut that furthermore won't be even visible when the device is fully assembled. And these undercuts are the main reason as to why we've had to remove standoffs from the enclosure and put them onto the PCB. Because not doing so would pretty much make it impossible for us to be able to mill away the aluminium in the corners, because there would simply not be enough room for the bits to come close enough. And even if that somehow were possible, the other obstacle we'd then face is mounting the PCB itself. You see, in order to get the PCB into the enclosure, we need to slide it in at an angle. And if the standoffs were on the enclosure itself, and because both the RJ45 ports and the magnetics that this standoff in particular comes between, are both very high, they'd collide and thus completely prevent us from getting the PCB in properly. And speaking about collisions, there's also another overhang that we have on this enclosure to prevent one additional collision. An overhang that is so small that I guarantee you wouldn't be able to spot it if you weren't watching this video, so I won't even bother asking whether you noticed it yet. And that overhang is one on the side of the outermost USB-C port. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. I've been working with them on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just for a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website, of course, down in the description. Back to the video. You see, unlike the SFP cages that will actually slide into the holes of the enclosure, USB connectors will not. They'll be hidden on the inside of the enclosure with only about a quarter of a millimeter distance between the two. But because the connectors themselves have a certain thickness to them and because the inner radius of the corner starts pretty much at the edge of the hole for this outermost connector, we had to make sure that the two wouldn't collide. And to do so, we actually had to have a custom drill bit made because, and this is pretty cool actually, we have to get in through the USB-C hole. Yes, you heard that right. We're using a special and tiny custom drill bit to chamfer an edge of the port through that port. Pretty amazing if you ask me, but there is a downside to that and that's the price. I mean, I don't have the final pricing yet, so I can't share any numbers at this point, but rest assured all these special tools and procedures of course add up. CNC machining in particular is usually priced per hour and this piece alone took around 35 minutes to complete. Now obviously this was only the first attempt, the primary purpose of which was to make sure everything is okay slash doable when it comes to the manufacturability of the enclosure, which means that once we have the PCB and can confirm that everything fits together properly, then we'll sit down and try to optimize things. One example of possible optimization are pretty much all the inner surfaces. We can take slower passes with smaller bits to ensure a smoother surface, or we can make faster passes with larger bits that will produce a rougher surface, which will consequent, consequently, consequently be done quicker, result, resulting... <laughs> English is hard in lower milling times. Let's do that again. We can take slower passes with smaller bits to ensure a smoother surface or we can make faster passes with larger bits that will produce a rougher surface which will consequently be done quicker resulting in lower milling speeds. There we go. And the same goes for anodizing, which in order to look great requires the surfaces to be prepared by a process called sandblasting. We can either sandblast everything equally or we can choose not to focus on the inner surfaces as much because, let's face it, they won't be seen by 99% of the users anyway. I mean, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that the inner surfaces won't be treated at all. Of course they will be, and to an untrained eye, they likely won't even look that different, if at all. What I am saying is that there are ways we can save a bit of money and once the prototypes are complete, we will shift our focus to price optimization because that will obviously impact the final price of the device as well. Okay, we have four more holes left to talk about and it's these four outermost ones. Since I'm a firm believer in the right to repair, we decided early on that we're going to make it as easy as possible for anyone to take this device apart without much fuss, 
which is why we designed a double bottom, so to speak. The enclosure bottom, one that you'll hopefully never need to take off, will be hooked into the cover by this middle overhang here at the back, then screwed in using these four screws. As you can see, this bottom will have holes that will allow you to replace the battery or mount M.2 cards, but maybe even more importantly, will allow for an easy access to debugging LEDs that will not be visible on the outside during normal operation. And yes, that is on purpose. We wanted to make a device that's unobtrusive and doesn't look like a freaking Christmas tree when on the shelf, but at the same time does allow you to debug if and when you need to. There will be one LED, however, that you will be able to see at all times, and that's the power slash normal operation LED. For that, we decided to simply make a cutout on the bottom cover that will allow for the status LED to shine through and leave this subtle glow beneath the device and under normal circumstances, it will glow white. But because it's an RGB LED, it will also allow to report any kind of issues using either colors or any number of blinking patterns you can think of. We're not quite there yet when it comes to firmware for this and we hope to make it as uncomplicated as possible so that you won't need a 50 page manual to know what a particular color or a blinking pattern means. Anyway, the final piece of the puzzle, the prototypes for which are being made this week, is the actual foot of the device and like I said, because we want to make it easy for all of you to have a peek inside, we decided to make it magnetic. And no, magnets don't disturb electronic devices as long as their polarity doesn't change. I'm saying this because I've had a lot of people ask me this question a lot of times. Apple's iPad, for example, has reportedly more than 90 of them, yet still works just fine, so rest assured, magnets are not an issue. I won't go any further about the foot in this video, because we want to make sure it works as we envisioned it to work, and I'll do a dedicated assembly video in one of the upcoming weeks anyway, so subscribe if you haven't yet. What I do want to touch on before we wrap this up though, is where we currently are with the production of the router. As I said, the missing parts of the enclosure are being milled this week, so first week of January of 2025, and I've already spoke to my friend who owns an anodizing shop, and we agreed he'll anodize our prototype enclosures sometimes next week. Another very important step that's taking place this week are also the PCBs. They have finally arrived to our pick and place facility here in Slovenia and they assured me the first six prototypes will be done by this Friday, so 10th of January, which is when I'll be able to pick them up. I mean, they did offer to ship them to me, but I decided that driving for two hours in one direction is totally worth it if I get to hold them in my hands before the weekend, right? And if I do, I'll also be able to make a video about them earlier and show them to all of you. So, a win-win. And if you're curious as to how they look as much as I am, give me a follow on Blue Sky because I'll post photos of them there the second I have them in my hands. All in all, I'm super happy with where we're at at this point. The enclosures will be done by the end of the week, the PCBs will also be done by the end of the week, and we've also prepared quite a lot of procedures and code for the bring up process that we'll do throughout January. I'll of course share all of that with you when the time comes, so for now, all that remains for me is to say this. Thank you for watching and a happy new year. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.